and we'll get started um, with some introductions and sort of the kind of the rules of our um, design dialogue. Um, thanks for joining. My name is John Bakke. Um, I am an assistant professor of instructional design and technology at Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, I've been with Designers for Learning now for three years um, and have done a number of different things with them, um, help design the MOOCs, um, kind of come up with the, the strategy and how to go about um, having designers work in the uh, MOOC. And then um, I'm one of the ones that um, really believes in the empathic design process, which you are all going through. And that's really how do you get into the, um, how do you get in the shoes of the learners and, and design to them? And, and that's sort of the process that we're taking. So this is a very informal get together. Um, Zoom has a very good chat room. So if you have questions that you wanna ask, please feel free to use the chat room. Um, and once we get going, People may be um, responding to one another in the chat and, and we can communicate that way. Or, you know, if you want to um, just jump in in the discussion, please do. Um, one, of this, one of the tougher things to do in a forum like this is everyone's at a different point and everyone may not be where someone else is, which is fine. That's what the design process is all about. Um, you know, so when we begin to speak with, if anybody has specific questions, um, you, you may not be where someone else is right now, and that's fine. Um, don't, don't feel that, you know, you're behind or anything like that, because everyone sort of goes at their, their own pace um, and, and keeps moving forward. Um, at this point, places where you you may be is um um you know the idea of this course and and as you as designers is we had two MOOCs that were that happened about 18 months ago back to back where we had designers go in and we led them through the process of actually designing a learning module for a that could be used um, for adult basic educators or um, by actual adults who are looking to um, prepare themselves to pass a high school equivalency exam. And then the last two moves, what we decided to do was we thought it would be interesting in, since we already had built up a number of learning lessons in um, the, um, in the, um, OER for the, um, the uh, open educational resources, we thought it would be interesting if we had designers go in, look at those, evaluate them, and then decide, am I going to build off this? Am I going to take this for a different audience? Um, is this something that I can tweak, change, um, add to? So we thought that would be a really good way of continuing this process. So one of the things that we hope that you start off with in this is, is looking at what has already been posted, seeing things that interest you. It may be that you're interested in math. It may be that you're interested in English. It may be that you're interested in um, a, a particular idea. And then look at that, evaluate it, and say, you know, what can I do with this? At the same time, we want you to be able to put yourself in the shoes of the learners, those being the adults that would be affected by your learning lessons. And the way we've done that is we, we've, we've created these personas. And just to give you a little feedback on the personas is our goal with these personas is that the personas are authentic and they're engaging. Okay? And that's really two different things. The 
the engaging point it part is, is that we want you to just like if you were watching your favorite television show or your favorite movie, you get engaged with characters, right? There's something about that character that you want to know more about that you, that you have an interest in. There's the engagement part. The, the authentic part is that we want these, these personas to represent adults who are working towards their high school equivalency. So we've done a lot of work with that. And these personas have gone through a process for them to become authentic. When we started this off, we had used a previous MOOC that had been used, and there was four personas that had been developed. We took those four personas as a starting point. Then we went to subject matter experts, those who are in adult basic education, and we surveyed them, and we asked them about the people that they work with, and they started to give us um, feedback. From that initial feedback, we, we discovered two areas that are very underserved, two types of people that are very underserved when it comes to assisting people in trying to earn a high school equivalency. And those are people that are in, in jail or prison. And those are people that come in very rural areas. So, um, you know, looking in the United States, um, you know, the state of Nebraska, which is, can, has some very rural areas, there are areas where there's not a lot of resources for people trying to get their high school equivalency. Therefore, what we did there was um, we created another persona, which ended up being the fifth persona, and that's Robert, who is in jail trying to um, earn his GED. Then what we did was we, we, we played around with these personas, we, try, we made them engaging, and then we took the personas and we asked six subject matter experts, these were adult basic educators, and we asked them to go through each persona and give us feedback. And the feedback that we got from them was great. And, and they said, you know, don't forget about this, think about this. Well, one of the challenges was, is that if we would have responded to all their feedback, we would have had nine or 10 different personas. And we felt that would be way too many. Because as a tool for you in designing, you, 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 want, to, you, you want to understand who the personas are. You want to understand who they are. And we have six right now. If you, if you do more than six, then it's kind of difficult for you to kind of get your arms around all of them. So what we did was, we knew that we had to create one more persona, and that was Mary. Mary was the last persona that we created. Mary is the, the young woman whose family, um, she was born in Mexico. Her family are, are workers, migrant workers in the southwest part of the United States, Colorado, California. Area. Like she, so she moves around a lot, and she doesn't have real strong English speaking skills. And so that was end up being our sixth persona. But the other information that we received, um, we ended up weaving into personas, okay? Things like <clears throat> um, people that went through high school and um, graduated, but didn't really, don't have the skills to, to take the next step in a community college or something like that. So we, we wove those into the personas that we have. I say that because we're asking you to identify with personas. We're, we're asking you to identify with a person that you can really get to understand what they're going through so you can design to them. But you may very well find one or two, maybe three different personas that really fit what you're thinking about in terms of designing. And you may also start taking pieces from persona and creating your own persona or something that, that, that you relate to. That is fine also. The important part is, is that you, be, you are designing in context. There's some type of context that you're designing to. And that context right now is coming from two different points from you. Number one is it's coming from a learning lesson that you have looked at and you want to tweak, improve, change, because that lesson has some type of context to it. And then the other context part is, is trying to relate to a persona that you can say, okay, th this is giving me an idea 
of who our learners are. And now I can begin to design to that person. So as you move through the MOOC, as you're designing, we're going to continuously ask you and have you reflect on who you're designing to. So you keep that person in your mind the whole time. So we've had the exercises of you reflecting on the personas. We've had you do the discussion where you start to understand from one another who people are designing to, why they're designing those people, the ideas they have for it. And then we had you do the empathy map idea where you began to look at that person and then begin to put yourself into their um, shoes. So that kind of gives you an overview of why we're using the personas, what we want you to do with the personas. And, 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 and it gives you what we're trying to do here in terms of using empathy in, in terms of design. And, and in the, one of the early modules, we, do the, um, we give you the empathy framework where you discover, immerse, connect, and detach. So the idea here is, is that when you begin to look at your personas, and I, I went to the discussion board today, and there was a lot of good dialogue with people talking about who they're, gonna, who they're going to design to, understanding though of that person, and starting to come up with ideas. And the empathy framework is really interesting because the first three phases of it, discover, immerse, and connect, is all about you getting in their life, right? And the important part is, is that when you think of these learners, you don't make judgments, okay? You're very open-minded. It's non-judgmental. You're just going in their, in their world, and, you, and you're kind of walking around and understanding them. And then you're trying to make a connection. That connection can be a lot of different things. The one connection could be is that you, um, you've experienced, you know somebody that's like that. That could be a connection. You have a family member that had a similar path. Maybe you had a similar path, or maybe it's just something that you can really connect to um, what they've gone through. But the important part is, is that once you've done all that, you have to detach yourself, right? You have to detach yourself from whomever you're designing to. And, and when you detach yourself, you're still taking in, in what they're going through. You're taking stock into their situation, but when you detach, you are then able to begin to come up with ideas and, and come up with ways that you could design something for that particular person, all right? So with that, um, I kind of open it up um, to those of you that are in here. Um, if you have questions, if you want to talk about where you're at, if you came here with a specific point, um, um, let me know. And, and, and um, I ask for other people's input because um, you may be going through the same um, situation and, and, and help one another. So um, does anyone have anything that they wanted to kind of kick off with in where they're at right now? and maybe some of the challenges they're having or things that are really going well. So just jump in, we don't, we don't need to make it anything formal. Just make sure that you do um, unmute yourself <laughs> when you do talk so um, we can hear you. Right, um, so my question is, um, in the beginning of the first chapter, we had to choose a course that we liked. Obviously when I chose my course, it was more applicable for somebody like Mary. Later on, I chose Malcolm. So I feel now that this course is not really applicable for him. To, can I just go back and change my persona or completely my course and just, you know, just choose bits and pieces from? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and that's really the process that we want you to go through. The personas are there to represent the learners. And we know that they're authentic. And, and we've, done, we've worked very hard to make sure that we were representing all the different types of learners without getting specific where you'd have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. That wouldn't make any sense. So you're going through the right path. That's exactly the path you take. And, and that's sort of the process of going back and forth and saying, okay, I was going to do this. It doesn't really fit for this learner. I like this um, actual learning 
module that I want to work on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back at the personas and, and, and find someone else that it may fit or take that module, I like it, and adapt it to Mary. Different ways of doing it. But I love the fact that you're thinking in that way because that's how you should be thinking. This is not meant for you to be pigeonholed, right? This is not meant for you to say, you, you pick this and you pick this. And that's really what the design process is all about because you're, I don't like to call it an iterative process, even though it is, because I don't like the word iterative because I always think that iterative has this idea that you have to start over. I, I, I like to call it an enhancement process because no matter what you've done so far, you're building on it. You're not scratching anything and, and, and starting all over, right? You're just building along. So, um, yeah, that is that is a great way of going about it. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Why don't everyone – excuse me, I didn't mean to cut you off, Julie. Okay. <laughs> um, everybody in the chat room, will you – just put in the chat room right now who you are, um, the personas you're following. So Julie's got Mary. I love Chris has got Robert and got some crystal in there. Very good. Malcolm, and possibly thinking, changing to Mary. Very interesting. All right, Julie, I, I, I cut you off, Julie. What, you had something that you are going to bring up. Yeah, I was just going to bring up the idea that um, when it came to choosing the personas, particularly related to the content that was already um, existing on the OER website, I found that it really depended on the actual module. So for me, I actually looked through the type of modules that existed there, and there were some really good ones, some really interesting ones. And um, I know that in the example that was in the description of the course, it talked about the job interview um, skills module that was, I think, one of the first ones mm -hmm. on the list. And so that one still really stuck out to me um, as a really good resource. And I liked how that one was really well developed. So that's kind of what led me to choosing Mary was actually going through the modules and seeing what was there. And so I might have done it in the reverse direction, but I thought it was um, a good resource for someone who was new to the country and was potentially looking for um, a way to improve their um, skills with regards to the workplace. Well, I mean, that, that's, you make a great point, Julie. And, and, and when, you went through the when you went through the modules, the Open Educating Resource Month, you'll notice that Many of the modules were designed in some type of context, right? Because one of the things that we, we received feedback from the adult basic educator subject matter experts, they said that you, you just, when, when you're getting adults ready to get a high school equivalency, um, you know, whatever that's going to be, and it's different. It used to be the GED, but there's other things now. One of the things is, is that it's just not testing them on what's five times five. It's what is the application of five times five. So you, you bring up the job interviewing one, which I think is fantastic. Because number one, it, it's in context and, it, and it's practical, right, Julie? Because you've got people that are trying to improve themselves and are going to need these job interview skills. But at the same time, you can take that module and you can bring in so much to that module, correct? For instance, it could be a module on writing a cover letter and you're covering good sentence structure mm, and, good yeah. ideas and good ways of presenting. And now you tie that into somebody like Mary that makes all the sense in the world. Or if you flip it, Julian, you think of, you think of Mary who's trying to improve her reading skills, right? You could almost have it in job interview, but in reading a job description. And, and synthesizing the information from that, not just reading it, but understanding and synthesizing it. So the point is, is that here is an opportunity for you to build a module that has a language 
aspect to it, the English aspect to it, but then it, it's something practical. For another one for Mary would be, you know, one of the things she wants to do is she wants to get her driver's license. Mm. So the module could be based around applying for a driver's license where you're building in all of the things on synthesizing information, understanding information, responding to information, things like that. So, so are you doing an opposite? I don't think so, Julie. Um, you know, I, I guess the only thing that I would say to you is don't get hung up on trying to tie something together. You know what I mean? That, that's not the process we want you. We don't want you to pick a, a, a learning module that you really, really like and then say, I've got to find a persona that matches it. Rather be, you know, you, you look at the personas and you look at people that you say, you know, this would be a person that would want to design some type of English literacy around, you know, some type of English skills around um, with this module. And then who is somebody that is sort of needs that? And then sort of dive into them and say, okay, I understand now how I could design that with them in mind. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, so you're not doing it backwards. I just don't want you to feel that you have, don't force it. You know what I mean? Don't yeah. like, oh my gosh, I, I, I picked this and there's, where's the match? And now, now I'm stuck with that. No, because what's going to end up happening is I guarantee you, and, and what we've seen so far in the other MOOCs is people change their personas as their design progresses. But the point is, is that the personas is helping you Keep in mind who you're designing to, and that's what we want you to do. We just don't want this. We just don't want you in this vacuum saying, "Well, I'm going to to design this um, this module," and 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 but you know, and I'm just going to design it the way I would want to. The literature shows that when you use personas, one of the big advantages of personas is is that designers often think. And I use designers across the board, instructional designers, software designers, they often design to what they think the user should need. We don't want you to do that. We want you to actually look at, at actual learners and say, what do they need versus you having to be in a position saying, I think I know what they need. Makes a lot of Big sense. difference. Big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm doing something similar um, with Robert and Crystal because I picked the module about uh, evaluating internet sources for research. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that's just really important to me because I teach seventh graders and they're terrible at this. So it's Fantastic. a stretch to move it to adults. But um, I kind of waffled on my personas a bunch because I didn't really have a module in mind. And then I found this one and it really seemed to connect well with Crystal and Robert kind of from two different angles. Crystal being someone who's familiar with technology, but not in an academic setting. And Robert, mm -hmm. who's not super familiar with technology and kind of growing towards it. I thought that might be an interesting kind of audience to target. And Chris, I love your, I love the way you've combined the two and, and that's fantastic. Um, and, and I also like, because I was going to say, okay, he's doing research on, on, um, you know, using the internet, I'm like, well, just don't remember, Robert would never use the internet because he wouldn't have the internet in jail. But the fact is it's not, it's not Robert in the sense of being jail, it's Robert with his skills. And, and I think that's really, really cool. I also love how you picked up on Crystal, the, the idea that she is somewhat tech savvy, but in a non-academic way which really could lend itself to a really cool way for you to begin to design that learning um, module based on the fact that um, how, do you, how do you capitalize on the fact that she's got social media skills, she's got those type of skills, and I'm just using Crystal as our example, and then how does, how does that translate into using the internet to do research? So that, that's very cool. But that's the whole point. You're picking that up, right? You're picking up the fact that you've got someone that, um, that has, has this, knows how to handle technology, but not from an ac academic perspective. I like that. Thanks. 
But I think that it's important, you know, one of the big um, eye openers, and I don't know if it was any, any for any of you, but one of the big eye openers that I had, because I'll be honest with you, when I started this project, I didn't know a lot about our learners. That's why I did the research on it. And that's why I suggested that we create these personas because I didn't even know. But it's so interesting that, you know, when you, when you first think about this, you know, everybody thinks that these learners are dumb, <laughs> that they're, they're, um, they're criminals. You know, that's not the case. These are oftentimes, and the subject matter experts told this over and over to us, oftentimes these adults are pretty good in one area. They've got good, strong math skills, but they're not so good in English or vice versa. And the situation is, is oftentimes it's life has dealt them situations that got in the way of them continuing with their education. Um, but they're still motivated. They're intelligent. I mean, you look at Mary, she, she writes poetry, she sketches. I mean, Robert's, you know, um, smart, um, you know, so it, you, you have these people that, that are so easy to stereotype. Um, unfortunately, like the stereotype is so wrong, so wrong. Kenyatta, you said that you have not selected a persona. Um, is it that you're still kind of just going through them right now, trying to, um, um, you know, reflect on them and, and, and see who connects to you? Yes, that's what I'm doing. I'm still going through the personas one by one to see if I can make a good connection with one or more that I select for the project. Have you, have you found a, um, a learning module that you like that you think you're going to work with to either change, tweak? Um, um, you know, have you done that? Um, it'll be in an, in the area of ELA, English okay. language arts. Yes. Is that something that's close to you? It's something that you work with? Yes. I work with, um, English language arts. I'm actually, I tutor ELA. Oh, so yes. Fantastic. Other questions or thoughts right now? This is good. You guys are all on the great path. I really, it's really great to see you embracing um, the process that, that we have. Um, um, you know, and, and, and these are great, great questions. And I love the fact that, that already people have been looking at this, saying to themselves, you know, I, I'm probably going to change. Um, you're starting to look down the road. I'm, I'm combining two. Um, I'm taking a little bit from, from two different personas that I think that really makes sense. Um, th this is really good. Um, my question is, that, um, I know we don't have set deadlines and stuff like that, but are there any specific time frames where we should be working? Uh, I mean, for now, I am on chapter two, and I'm mm -hmm. just trying to go as fast as I can because yep. obviously when I've got my course evaluation or development or whatever I choose to do I need to have some time and I just like to know how much time that is meant to take and when the whole thing should be kind of like submitted that um we, what we're trying to do is and that's a great question because in the past we have really been we we tried to create set timelines and um and we found that that was good and bad the good was that it kept people on track. The bad was is that when people find that they're falling behind, because um, you're volunteers, you're, you're volunteer instructional designers, that they sometimes say, well, I'm, I'm falling behind, so I'm going to drop out. So to answer your question, um, we will continue to push you along. And we will continue to be sending you notices saying, hey, you know, you should be here or this is a good spot to be at, but don't feel that that means that you're behind okay so keep plugging along um is there a definite timeline no but i would highly recommend that you keep some progress going because what's going to happen is is if there's big breaks you lose the momentum of the design the idea here is that we design for a purpose right we we're, we're instructional designers so we're designing 
for a end product, right? It's, it's, not, it's not meant for you to, you know, design a little bit and then sit back and reflect on it and say, okay, I'll change this and change that and never get it done. All right. And, and because design has a beginning, a middle and end. OK. And <clears throat> design also oftentimes is just good enough design. And what I mean by that is very rarely do we have the opportunity to design something that's perfect. Right. Because we have all kinds of constraints. So it could be it could be money. It could be time. It could be resources, whatever that is. You're going to have constraints as you go along. So the fact is, is that you're going to have an end product that you're going to be pleased with, but it's not going to be perfect um, because that's just not the way design works, unfortunately. Um, but if we take in everything in consideration and give you the guidance and you go along and move along through the modules, you're going to produce a product that is going to be a good product that you can use yourself or someone else is going to use it. So. Don't get hung up on deadlines, but certainly create the deadline for yourself saying, I want to be by here, I want to be by here. You know, I want to have my, mo my module done by. So, but we'll continue to um, help you along um, in, in kind of telling you, this is where you should be. Um, and then that gives you a good um, point of view saying, okay, I am there or I'm not there, so. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. Others. Hey, I just had a, can, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah, so I just had an observation. I've been kind of lurking the last couple of iterations of this project and uh, all of what you've said uh, fits right in because it's really easy to um, fall into the project creep, you know, infamous for project creep. And uh, getting stuck on one thing, it's kind of easy to and comforting almost to always get stuck on one thing because you realize, oh, um, this is kind of uh, maybe if I'm having this problem, then it's something that I shouldn't be really approaching. But the more I've uh, uh, gotten used to design, the more I realize, no, that's where you keep pushing through. And like you said, it's never going to be good enough. So you have to kind of like force yourself to kind of uh, hang it up and you know see it there on the wall and go okay well i can get better next time and so it's for me it's been quite difficult to to do that uh, it's been quite difficult to uh kind of uh, just let it let it be so i think for me the last couple of times i haven't been able to finish and oh. i haven't been able to go through the whole duration uh, but this time it's kind of um after hearing all of you guys and and what you've said it uh, makes me a little bit more i don't know um uh, courageous just to kind of like throw whatever it is I have out there because it's never going to be good enough, you know, or, or exactly, you know what I mean? Exactly what no, you want. Alex, and that is like, I am so glad you brought that point up because that is an extremely important point. And, and the, important, the important point is, is, is using a approach that says, you know what, here's what I've done so far. Mm. Tell me what you think. Mm -hmm. and, and, having, and having the confidence that it's not done. I know it's not done. Mm -hmm. But, but our, our nature is what? We always want to present stuff that's really, really good. Exactly. And, yeah. and it's what you're talking about. You get into this circle. It's like, okay, I got to redo it. I got to redo it. I got to redo it. No, put it up there. Mm -hmm. You look at it. And then you have Julie look at it. And you have Kenyatta look at it. And they, mm -hmm. they, they sit there and say, Alex, I don't understand this. This doesn't make any sense to me. And you're like, oh yeah, I, I didn't see that. Or they're saying, I get it. But how about if, or what if you do this? And I'm telling you, Alex, it's a hard thing to do. Yeah, no kidding. It's a, it's a hard thing to teach people in design that if you can get over that hump and say, I, I call it, I, I call it giving people something to react to and make it rich. And, and the react to part is throw something up there and have people react to it. The rich part is, is you're just not throwing anything up there. There's a rhyme or reason behind it, right? Mm -hmm. So when you throw something up there, Alex, and say, this is where I'm at right now. And Julie's saying, 
Alex, why'd you do that? You, you defend yourself. Exactly. Is because what I'm thinking about is, and then Julie's like, oh, that makes sense, but did you think of, and then you go from there. I do it in my classes, and, 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 it, and we, we do these long projects in my classes, okay? And, and where they're actually designing interventions. And we do it over a four or five week period. Well, part of it is, is that the students have to present something in class wherever they're at. They have to put it up on the board and everybody looks at it and we, when we critique it and we give them feedback. And I'm telling you, when that process happens, the end product is so much better. So what, what's funny is, is design is just good enough but if, if, you, if, you, if you do it, if you go through your design process where you, whatever, whatever it is, sketch, model, outline, and you, you reflect on it, you have somebody else reflect on it, you throw it into the discussion board and say, hey, guys, this is where I'm at right now. What do you think? People give you feedback. Then you take that and it gets back to, I don't believe in the iterative process. I believe in the enhancement process because you're never going to throw anything away. You're never going to say, oh, I'm starting all over. All you're doing is you're saying, you know what? That's where I was. This is where I'm going now. Right. Yeah, exactly. And that, that, that movement, that, uh, the, uh, the ability to allow yourself to be, I, I guess, vulnerable would be the word. Yes. I, yes. Alex, exactly. So personal, you know? I yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of like, you know, cause the vulnerability comes in the part that nobody knows what it took for you to get where you're at. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then right, and somebody sits there and says, yeah. I don't get it. Yeah. And you're like, and then you kind of like, afterwards, you just kind of sit there and go, wow, you know, I'm an idiot, or that was embarrassing, or Boy, right. they're really ahead of me. But then if you sit back for a minute and, and let that all go away, and then sit there and say, wait a minute, that's a great idea they have. I'll give, you, I'll give you a great example. I just, I submitted a article to a journal and I got feedback and it was rejected. The article was rejected. I got feedback from three reviewers and, and one reviewer was kind of not very constructive. And anyways, so I was really upset, you know, because I took it hard, you know, I did a lot of work on this. And then I read through it today and one of the reviewers just gave me a fantastic idea that I would have never thought. And I said to myself, you know what? I put myself out there. I, 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 I did the, you know, I, no one said that it could never be an article. They just said it needs some work. So I, I put something out there. I had people give me feedback on it. And now I got a fantastic idea that I can build on. And so it's kind of like, I went from, you know, I'm the worst writer in the entire world <laughs> to, you know what? Somebody just gave me a great idea that really, really could make this a fantastic article. And, and I don't even know the person. I can't even thank the person because it's a blind review. So it's not like I can go shake their hand. You know what I'm saying? I mean, when you're in a discussion board and you throw something up there and Julie gives you a great idea, Alex, you can at least say, Julie, that was a fantastic idea. Or if Chris does, it's like, you know, thank you so much. Um, but uh, yeah, great point. I'm really glad you brought that up because I think that's really important. And it's interesting that you say that. Because it would be interesting to know that those don't, that don't make it through to an end product, I wonder if those were some of the stumbling blocks they had. That they're early in the design process, they don't, and so they just got stuck or they kept on going around or they, or they just said, I gotta have the most perfect thing before the end and it just never came about versus saying little chunks along the way, partial solutions, I like to call it, partial yeah. solutions. Well, right. I, think, I think this is the, uh, the this is the thing with MOOCs, right? I mean, uh, when you are uh, learning from a remote location and you don't have the interpersonal reaction or uh, interactions that you usually have in a design process, when you're all in the same room together, yes. knocking stuff out, this uh, I guess this gap is the hard thing to bridge, just you know internally. Uh, but um, you know, uh, the professionals that I've talked to, the professional designers, go through the same thing. But it's about being disciplined, about removing yourself just enough from the process and just putting things out there. And for me, that's uh, as a beginning instructional designer, I think that's just something I got to learn, you know? Absolutely. And, and believe me, the quicker you learn it, the better designer you're going to be. 
Um, it, it really is. I mean, when you look at what they consider master designers and, and the process they go through, that's what they do. And, and, and they say, I'm going to let, I'm putting something out there and I'm hopefully I'll get feedback on it and I'll take a look at it and then I'll move on. So, um, but yeah. it, it's a, it, it's a whole, it's the, the concept is called satisficing, satisficing, which basically is the idea. And it was brought up. It was, it was a term that Herbert Simon used very early in the late sixties. He wrote a book on design and the idea is, you are never going to have, he says that very rarely are, do you have the opportunity as a designer to design an optimal solution. Designed just good enough. And when you can look at, and it's all based on all of the constraints that you have. Everything that, you know, the, the everything that you consider is a constraint. And one of the constraints that all of you have is your personal free time. <laughs> Because you all are doing other things and you have to make a decision. Am I going to continue going through this, getting the experience of doing this? Or am I going to, you know, watch a movie or go to the park or things like that? So, Yeah, thank you. Mm, thank you. Oh, I love it. And, and also sometimes it's not how perfect it looks, but how usable and effective it actually is. Very good. And that was in the chat room. I love that. Alex, man, if you're, if you're getting your seventh graders, uh, um, if you're, if you're getting your seventh graders thinking this way, that's fantastic. Um, Chris, I'm sorry. Chris has the seventh graders. Correct? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's Chris. Chris, you have yep. the seventh graders, right? Yeah, that's me. Yeah. If you get them to start thinking this like this now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right now we're we're very focused in the education sphere on the whole growth mindset, Carol Dweck mm -hmm. idea, and getting them to just try something when it's hard for them, even if it's not going to be good, like amazing, because they're seventh graders, is kind of a big thing for them. Absolutely. I work with high school students, and it's very much the same, especially since um, the program that I work with is with a lot of students who are actually gifted or doing advanced placement courses. And so with these students, it's very much like the perfectionism is a very strong hurdle for them. And um, I think that's one of the first things that we have to work with when it comes to um, just that growth mindset aspect of their learning. So very, very many of my students, um, they want to make sure it's perfect the first time and absolutely the best before they actually move forward. And we're trying to really instill the idea of like, it doesn't need to be perfect. The point is just, that you have some product there that we can discuss and um, collaborate on and then improve from there. Absolutely. It's, you know, it, it gets back to when you look at master designers, um, they live in the problem, right? They don't jump to the solutions really quick. They live in the problem and they try to figure out what the actual problem is and, and they try to get as mon many resources as they can and really look at that. And then they start to build those partial solutions. What they find oftentimes, novice designers want to just go right to the solution, right? And, and they don't, don't want to think about, you know, who am, I, who am I designing for? What do they need? Um, how can I help them? Um, and all those types of things, and then start building from there. So it um, it's a it's a very it's a designing. It was there's there's people that say that designing is one of the highest levels of thinking. Is 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 the ability to design? And the funny part is, is that we're wired to do it. Think of you as a kid. Think of the things you made out of Legos or Play-Doh. Or, or, or all of those types of things. You've been a designer all your life. And the fact is, is that as we get older, we, we seem to um, lose, think we lose that, but it's always there. It's always there. So um, um, we're wired to do it, but it's very difficult to do. And it's a high level of thinking. Good stuff. I love the I, lo I love these types of conversations. Really, really good.
Other thoughts, questions. Read through the discussions. They're really, really good when people begin to talk about who they're designing to and the ideas that they're coming up. And even if you don't necessarily think you have to, you know, always respond to them, but there's some really, really interesting ideas that come up that really may trigger you. And that's the other thing too, is it's not only, you know, it's not only what you're doing, but what other people are doing, like, oh, that's such a great idea. I can integrate that. Or that would be a great piece that I could bring into mine. It looks like, are all of you school teachers in one way or another? Yeah, I am. <laughs> I am as well. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I'm looking to transition into instructional design at some point, but currently I'm teaching. Mm -hmm. Good. I'm in a similar boat. <laughs> um, the type of role that I have with high school students is actually somewhat unconventional. Um, what I do technically is I help coordinate an online education um, course, in a sense. And what it does is it provides high school students, I'm from Ontario, Canada, um, mm -hmm. with co-op placements in which they can work with researchers or professionals who are in their field of interest. And so the idea is that the two will work together and um, work on a research project, and the student will get co-op credits for it. So there is quite a bit of online education that is incorporated into my role and I kind of like that aspect. And so I too am interested in transitioning into a career where I might be doing some more instructional design type mm. tasks. Excellent. Virginia, you ask what will happen to the courses once we provide evaluation input? What did you mean specifically on that, Virginia? I just wanted to be sure that um, First, can you hear me? Yeah, you sound great. Okay, good. Um, I just wanted to uh, be sure that I understood the evaluations that we're providing is to improve the courses. To imp it could be to improve a course, to tweak a course, to change a course. Um, so we, we want to keep it a little open. We don't want you to get pigeonholed, Virginia, and thinking that you have to take a course and then make that course better for, for whatever reason. If you have a course that you think this is an interesting course, but I have a different idea for it, still keeping some of the framework of that course, that is fine also. So um, I guess what I'm wondering is once the courses are finished and this, this, um, this uh, class is done, what happens to those courses? they're going to be available to anybody in OER Commons. So they're going to become an open education resource that anyone that is interested in being an adult basic educator, be it a, 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 an adult learner, can go and take one of those, use it, modify it, what have you. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah, it'll be available for, um, for the world to get to. <laughs> Absolutely. And you are a technical writer and instructional designer, huh, Virginia? Yes, um, I, I recently got a, uh, an e-learning instructional design certificate from UCI online. But I have, I have about 30 years of experience as a technical writer. Fantastic. Good. Um, no teaching. That's fine. No, that's, I mean, we, we get people with a lot of different backgrounds. So that's, that's great. Uh, Kenyatta, you actually taught in a prison setting. That's very interesting. So you can relate to Robert. Yes, yes, sir. Well, that's interesting to be um, in. I actually taught business technology courses in a computer lab, so I had to teach them basic computer skills, um, software such as Microsoft and Corel software. Mm -hmm. And even about the internet, so I had to get kind of creative about with teaching them about the internet when they didn't actually have access to the internet. That's great. I mean, I just find that fascinating that that um, that that you were in that type of environment. 
So did you, to do that, Kenyatta, did you set up like an intranet or something? Yes, I, um, I created screenshots to teach them about the basic skills of the internet. And I used those to help teach the lessons that I had to take. And it was a pretty effective lesson. I mean, talk about the constraints, <laughs> design constraints. I mean, certainly album. I mean, that, that's great. Very, very good. Was that a, yeah, a volunteer thing that you did or was that part of your job or? No, it was actual paid position. I, I was actually employed at a two year institution of college and I was assigned to teach courses that the um, students, they received certificates for completing those while they were in prison from that two year college. That's Fascinating. Great. I like your point, Chris, that you just put in the chat. Yeah, I, I've been teaching almost six years now. And at the beginning, it was very much just like, do the lessons. Mm -hmm. Differentiation is really hard as a new teacher. But now that I'm, I'm getting, you know, quite a bit more experience, it's just really kind of fun to be able to try and pick stuff that will work for kids that just have no interest in let's say science because that's what I teach mm -hmm. and kids that come from backgrounds where that's really not their strong suit. Absolutely. I love these teachers having the instructional design bug in them. This is, this is cool. Very cool. And we've got about five minutes left. Is there anything else that anyone wants to address or, I mean, we're going to have these, as you see, we're good. these are going to be scheduled on a regular basis. So, um, you know, we're still early in the design process. So what I would love to see happen is that as we get down the line, we, we can actually have people share where they're at with their designs and start and, and maybe even create these in being like a critique and, and using that philosophy of, okay, let's get over the fact that this isn't done. I'm going to be vulnerable and I'm going to throw something up on the screen and let everybody make comments on it, ask questions on it to make it a better design. That might be an interesting way for us to, to move forward as we go along because um, then you're, you're really getting the benefit of working with other, others um, and, and getting great input um, and, you know, feedback on where you're at and, and where you could go. So um, I will certainly, at the end of this, when I debrief with um, Jennifer Madrill, and, and that might be something that we, we may want to have happen because I think that could be kind of fun. I think I agree. I think that would be a really great opportunity, again, because that vulnerability is really an yep. issue when you are developing these types of things for the first time, especially. And um, this is my first time participating in this. Yeah. So uh, I think that'd be a great opportunity to actually learn about how other people are doing um, their own modules or their own evaluations mm -hmm. and learn from that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we, the more input, the better. What's that, Virginia? The more input, the better. Absolutely. Absolutely, I agree. I agree. I think that's what we'll do. I think that I think we'll have that as part of um, and again, it'll be a volunteer basis. But I think what we'll do is when we send out the the notice for the next one, we'll put in there that that come if you want to get input on something, come with something that you can share with um the group and, and get feedback on. And I, I think that would be a lot of fun and would really bring up some more discussion on um, not only the design process, but the end product. And and because that's one of the things that we want to happen here. We, we want everyone to understand the process and get a different look at approaching instructional design, but also knowing that you are going to produce something that's going to be out there that anyone can go and grab and use, and which I think is very, very cool. All right. I appreciate you joining me. This was a lot of fun. And um, keep designing, keep designing. Um, 
You have a lot of resources within the MOOC on asking experts. If you're getting stuck on technical things like the standards, um, you know, what you, sh what you should design to and how your model's got to have certain um, standards built in it. And you're going to see that in a module coming up. You may not be there yet, but we do give you resources on where you find those standards. Um, we, have, we have a nice team of experts that if it's an instructional design question, if it's a specific question regarding adult basic education, there are enough people out there. So use that resource and also use one another in the discussion boards. All right. All right, everyone, thanks for joining and we will see you in the MOOC. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.